the women and welcome to Sunday morning Bible study. Well, today we are beginning a new feast. We have learned in our study on the feast of the Lord that Jesus fulfilled the four spring feasts at his first coming, and he will fulfill the three fall feasts at his second coming. And we have studied the first of the three fall feasts, the Feast of Trumpets. And we learned that Jesus will fulfill this feast at his second coming when he returns for us to take us back to heaven for our wedding ceremony when we will become his bride. Our wedding day will be on the Feast of Trumpets. Now, we're ready for the sixth feast, the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. In this study, we'll learn exactly what this feast is, and most of all, we'll learn how Jesus will fulfill this feast, and we'll learn how this feast is a vital part of our marriage to Jesus, our beloved bridegroom. Oh, I can't wait to share with you the wonderful truths about the Feast of the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. So let's begin our study by learning about what this feast is, and learning how it was celebrated in Old Testament times, and how the Jewish people celebrate this feast today. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, verses 26 through 32. And the Lord spake, or spoke to Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this month there shall be a day of atonement. Here's our feast. It shall be a holy convocation, a mikra, a holy convocation unto you. And ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Verse 29, for whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And if you read this portion of Leviticus 23, in verse 31, it says it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. The feast of the day of atonement was to be observed, God said, on the tenth day of the seventh month, which is the month of Tishri, on the Hebrew calendar. And it took place ten days after the Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, the feast that we just finished studying. Now, the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, is Israel's most awesome, or most holy day. Even after its institution of over 3,500 years ago, the Day of Atonement still remains the most solemn day of the year for the Jewish people. God said that on this day, verse 27, ye shall afflict your souls. Well, what does this mean? On this day, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, all of the children of Israel, all of God's people were to fast. They were not only to abstain from eating food, but they were not even allowed to drink water. Not one sip of water, not one bite of food. It was the day devoted to fasting and repenting of your sins that you had committed during the past year. It's a time that they set aside and pray and seek God and ask God for forgiveness for the sins that they had committed this past year. Now remember, we're talking about the Jewish people in the Old Testament days and the Jewish people today that have not accepted Jesus as their Messiah. We know that, that he... He has forgiven our sins. He places our sins under his blood when we repent, when we confess our sins. We don't have to wait a whole year for a certain day. We repent immediately and ask God for forgiveness, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sin. Now, this is the only day that 
that God commanded his people to fast. God was so serious about this day that, look at it again, he said in verse 29, anyone who does not afflict his soul by fasting shall be cut off. What does that mean? They will be put to death. God is serious about this day, the day of atonement. They were to fast for 25 hours. From sunset on the 9th of the month of Tishri till sunset on the 10th. Normally you would think that's 24 hours, but they added one more hour just to be sure for time difference. And that they did not break this fast too early and that they kept this fast just as God prescribed. From evening to evening, verse 32 says... What made the Day of Atonement so important? What does the word atonement mean? Anyway, this is a word we don't use today much. The Hebrew word atonement is kippur, and it comes from a root word which means expiation. It means atonement. This word kippur is why the Day of Atonement is called Yom Kippur. The root word of Kippur in Hebrew, according to my brown driver and Briggs Hebrew lexicon, the, the root word is kafar, which means to cover over, to atone for sin, to make an atonement for, cover over. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, says, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement or a covering for the soul. Yom is the Hebrew word for day, and Kippur means covering. So we have day of covering. Yom Kippur, or day of atonement, is the day of covering. And it was to be made for the previous year's sins of the people. This atonement or covering consisted of a blood sacrifice of an innocent animal. Remember, Jesus hadn't been born. He hadn't come to earth yet to die on the cross for, for our sins. So the only way the people could receive atonement or covering of their sins was for the blood of of a sacrificial animal to be sacrificed on the altar. Now, remember this blood of an animal sacrifice could not remove the people's sins. It could only atone for, it could only cover over their sins of the past year. Oh, but we know that the blood of Jesus, he was our supreme sacrifice. His blood does not just cover over or completely hide our sins. His blood completely washes away our sins, removes our sins. He removes our sins as far as from the east is from the west. He casts our sins behind his back. He casts them in the depths of the sea. He remembers uh, them against us no more. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of, of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Animal sacrifices, the blood of innocent animals couldn't remove the people's sins. That, that blood can only atone for, only cover over their sins. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 12. We are sanctified. How? Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Here we see it clearly. The blood of these innocent sacrifices, the priest had to offer these innocent animals over and over and over, but their blood could not take away the people's sins. Oh, but look at verse 12. But this man, who is it talking about? This man, Jesus, 
after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Aren't you glad that we don't have to bring a sheep, a bull, or a goat to church and, and pastor have to offer that animal as a sacrifice for our sins? Oh, this man, the man Jesus, he became the ultimate, the supreme sacrifice for our sins forever. Now, get it clear in your mind, the blood of the Old Testament animal sacrifices, all that could do was atone or cover over the people's sin, but it could not remove them or take them away forever like the precious blood of Jesus does. I like to think of the word atonement as at one minute. Our sins separate us from God, but Jesus' blood brings us near and makes us one with him again, restoring us into right fellowship with him once again. Now, look at your hand out there. There's three passages of scripture which gives us the details of the day of atonement. Number one, divine instructions were given by God for the high priest in Leviticus chapter 16. Number two, divine instructions were given by God for the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices. In Numbers chapter 29, verses 7 through 11, and divine instructions were given by God for the people. In Leviticus chapter 23, verses 26 through 32. Now, it would be impossible to cover every event in detail that took place on this one day, on the Day of Atonement. It would take months to cover it. So I'm only going to, in this study of, of the feast, the Day of Atonement, I'm only going to cover some of the main points concerning this feast, concerning this day. The Day of Atonement was the only day of the year in which the high priest was permitted or allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies in the temple and stand before the very presence of God, stand in the glory of God, hidden behind that veil of the Holy of Holies. It was absolutely crucial for the high priest not to become ritually or ceremonially unclean, or he would be unfit to perform his duties that God required him to perform on this day, on the Day of Atonement. So to prevent any possibility of this happening, the high priest was required to leave his home one week before the Day of Atonement and stay in the high priest's quarters inside the temple itself. During the week, the high priest practiced he practiced everything that he had to do on the Day of Atonement. He practiced sprinkling the blood with his thumb and his forefinger. He practiced burning the incense on the incense altar. He practiced lighting the menorah, the candlestick, the lampstand. He practiced every step that he would be doing on the Day of Atonement. He rehearsed his movements throughout the temple because there could be no mistakes. What would happen if the high priest made a mistake and did something wrong on the Day of Atonement? He would die instantly, and the sins of the people would be uncovered. They would not be atoned for for the past year. So it was crucial, it was vital that this high priest do every step exactly as God commanded it to be done. And in research, I learned that in the 410 years that the first temple, Solomon's temple stood, there were, was only 12 high priests because these priests were very righteous and they lived for God, they served God with their whole heart, and God blessed them with a long life. But in the 420 years that the second temple stood, 
the Herod's temple, the temple that Jesus entered into and taught in this temple. In the 403 years that the second temple, Herod's temple, stood, there was over 300 high priests because of the spiritual decline of the people in those days. Many of the high priests were corrupt. Many of them were just in the position because they were appointed by the Roman government and the Roman military. And so they, they weren't even supposed to be in the position of high priest. But they were corrupt, many of them. Sounds like the nation of America today, doesn't it? Our leaders, many of them, don't serve God, don't keep God's laws, God's commandments. Oh, we've got to, we've got to become holy, like in God commands. Now, in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 4, if you want to jot that scripture down, on any other day, the high priest, when he entered into the temple, he would only wash his hands and his feet in water at the labor. That was the bowl where they had water for the priest to wash their hands and feet in. So uh, during the day, during a normal day, the high priest only washed his hands and feet one time. But on the Day of Atonement, on this day, he was required to not just wash his hands and feet, but totally immerse himself in water. We would say baptize himself in water. And then he would put on his golden high priestly garments. He would put them on very carefully. And on the hem of his magnificent blue robe were small golden bells and crocheted pomegranates. That's why pomegranates are so important in the fall feast. On the high priest robe, there will be a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, all the way around the hem of, of his garments. And these small golden bells would ring. They would make a sound as he moved, performing his duties in the temple so that the people outside could hear him as he worked because he was representing them before God Almighty. And on top of the high priest's robe, he wore a golden breastplate which had 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, Dan, Naphtali, all of the tribes, each one of them. He wore a breastplate with 12 different colored stones with each of the names of the tribes. Oh, that's a whole teaching in itself. And so I don't have to have time to cover that. But after putting on his high priestly garments, the, the high priest washed his hands and his feet to begin his morning duties. And after he finished, he would return, he returned to his bath chamber and he changed clothes. He took off his high priestly royal garments and he changed and put on white linen garments before he got ready to enter into the Holy of Holies. Now, I'm sure that you have heard the story of how they, they wrapped a rope around the ankle of the high priest in case that he was struck dead inside the Holy of Holies because nobody could enter into the Holy of Holies except the high priest. And I'm, I'm sure that you have read that they tied a rope around his ankle, and if, if the bell stopped ringing, then if there was silence, they would know that he had dropped dead. And they would just pull him out of the Holy of Holies with that rope. No, wrong, wrong, wrong. He didn't have on his high priestly robe with the bells and the pomegranates. He had only put on the white linen garments. Drop this scripture down, Leviticus 16 and verse 23. When he came out of the Holy of Holies, it tells you that he put off or he took off his white linen robe and drop down Leviticus chapter 16, verse
verse 24 tells you that he washed himself again at the labor and put on his holy garments, which had the bells and the pomegranates around the hem as he performed his duties. So he didn't even have on his priestly garment with the bells when he entered into the holy of holies. So that's just what I call a charismatic lie. That's just a made-up story that people have believed over the years because the scripture plainly tells us there in Leviticus chapter 16 that he didn't have on his high priestly garment with the bells and pomegranates when he entered into the Holy of Holies. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest changed his garments five times during the Day of Atonement, he would put on his high priestly garments with the bells and pomegranates, perform part of his duties. Then he would take them off and baptize and mix by himself in water and then put on his linen garments back and forth. Five times he changed his garments during this one day. And he washed his whole body five different times. Every time he changed clothes, he immersed himself. He washed himself in water. And on this day, he washed his hands and feet not one time, but ten times throughout the day on the Day of Atonement. The afternoon service of the Day of Atonement was the most important of them all. The afternoon service began with a bullock a bull being sacrificed for the sins of the high priest and then for all of the other priests. According to Jewish tradition, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, there were over 500 priests who, who assisted, who helped the high priest because there was a total of 15 animals sacrificed on this day. And so there was no way that one man... The high priest could offer 15 sac animal sacrifices in one day. So there were over 500 priests on duty that day to assist him. So the high priest began his afternoon duties by laying both of his hands on the head of that bullock as a sign of identification with that bullock as his substitute. And he would make a confession of his own sins. And three times during this confession, the high priest would pronounce the covenant name of the Lord, Y-H-W-H. This name is considered so holy that it is forbidden to be spoken by the Jewish people. It would, this holy name of God was so holy that, that nobody pronounced this name except the high priest and he could only pronounce it on this one day on the day of atonement this name is so holy it's called the ineffable name or the unutterable name and modern theologians call it the tetragrammaton Jewish people refer to this name of God as simply the name. Why? Because they, they are not going to pronounce it because it is forbidden for them to pronounce it. This is the most holy name of God. And each time the high priest uttered this name of God, all of the other priests in the holy place, not in the holy of holies, only the high priest could enter into the holy of holies, but the high priest out in the holy place, the second portion of the temple, all the other priests that was assisting him would fall on their faces in worship and repeat this. They would say, blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. So the high priest spoke the name, this most holy name, ten times during the day on the Day of Atonement. And Jewish rabbis say that after the Day of Atonement had passed, that the high priest forgot how to pronounce it. And he wouldn't remember it till the next year on the Day of Atonement when God would supernaturally give him the ability to speak his most holy name again. 
And after laying his hands on the head of the bull and the high priest confessing his sins on that head, it was as if he was going to place his own sins on that bull. And when that bull died and its blood was sacrificed, then his sins would be atoned for, covered. But we know that the blood of Jesus completely removes our sins. So after he confessed his sins on the head of that bull, placing his hands on it, he would walk to the eastern side of the altar where two goats stood side by side facing the temple. Leviticus chapter 16, verses 7 through 10. Look at your handout. And he, speaking of the high priest, shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's, who was the high priest, shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go, let this goat go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Now, get the picture in your mind, two goats. These two goats were identical in size, in color, and in value, their, their cost, if they were sold. Because these two goats were considered to be one sacrifice. One goat was to be killed, and the other goat, God said, you were to let it go. What's the significance of this? These two goats, they symbolically represented indwelling sin and the guilt of, that accompanied sin. So these two animals were required. One was killed, the other one was let go. And remember, under the Old Covenant, sin could not really be blotted out and removed. It was only atoned for or covered over until the Lord Jesus came as the supreme sacrifice. Not only to take upon himself our sins and our guilt from our sins, but also by shedding his blood. He blotted out our sin and removed it forever. Hallelujah. So these two goats are very significant. The high priest standing close to these two goats, he then walks over to a golden urn. We would say a pitcher called a coffee, C-A-L-P-I, in which inside this golden urn were two golden lots, two stones that were identical in size, color, and value. One lot on one of these stones was written the words for Y-H-W-H. That's the most holy name of God. And the other lot, the other stone on it was written the words for Azazel, which is from the Hebrew root Azel, which means escape, from which we have in our English Bibles the word scapegoat. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 8, verse 10, and verse 26. So you got a golden urn. Inside is two lots. On one is written God's holy name. On the other lot or stone is written the words for Azazel. So the high priest, he shook that urn and he then placed both hands inside of that urn and he took one lot in each hand. Then he walked over to the two goats and he laid one lot on the head of each goat in between their horns, in between the horns of these goats, he placed one of the lots. And after placing the lot for YHWH, we would say Yahweh, after placing that lot upon 
long ago came once again. Speak the name, the name, the most holy name of God. And the goat upon which the lot for Azazel fell was immediately identified by tying a crimson strip of wool to that goat's horns. That strip of wool, and the Jewish people call it a tongue because of its shape. The high priest turns that goat to face the people at the temple's eastern gate through which the goat will be led out. That goat's going to be led out of the gate through the eastern gate. The high priest then ties a piece of crimson wool around the neck of the goat on which the lot fell for Yahweh. So some teach, now get this, if you have heard that, and I was in the audience of a well-known TV evangelist, and it, it was recorded live, and it was broadcast to millions of people, and him and several of your other modern scholars, they teach that this goat, which had the title of the lot for Azazel, they teach that this goat represents Satan. Wrong, wrong. Satan cannot take away our sins. He's the culprit that tempts us to sin. There's no way that the devil can remove our sins, atone for our sins. He was a murderer from the beginning, Jesus said. And he cannot remove our sins. Impossible. So if you've heard that teaching, that's another one of those charismatic lies that is wrong. So I want you to understand that Satan can never take away your sins. He's the one that tempts you to sin. So this, this scapegoat called for Azazel cannot represent Satan. All through the Old Testament, we see types, shadows, pictures of Jesus. This scapegoat is a type, a shadow, a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus, remember, was brought before Pilate. He, Jesus, stood before the people, and he was about to be led forth, bearing, carrying the iniquity, the sins of us all. And then after, think about it now, you got the same picture in your mind after the two goats were marked with a strip of crimson red wool. The high priest goes back into the sanctuary. He lays his hands once again on the head of the bull for the second time now. Not, not only is he confessing his sins, but this time he's confessing the sins of the whole priesthood. Every one of the priests, now he's confessing their sins. So the high priest then kills this bullock and catches its blood in a golden basin. What does the high priest do next? Then he took a golden fire pan or a censer and he walks up the ramp to the altar and he filled that fire pan with live coals from off the altar. And then he took two handfuls of incense, sweet smelling incense, and he placed them into a golden ladle in order to carry these this incense. And every eye of all the people were riveted on this white robed high priest as he walks through the holy place and then disappears behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies. This first temple contained the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat on top. And on top of that, it was covered with, by two cherubims, two angels with their wings outstretched above the mercy seat. And this is where the visible, tangible presence of God himself, in the Shekinah glory of, of the Lord dwelt, was inside this Holy of Holies above the mercy seat. But after the destruction of 
the first temple, after Solomon's temple was destroyed, the Ark of the Covenant was never found. It has not been found to this day. Some rabbis say that they know where this Ark is, and when the third temple is rebuilt, then they will bring forth the, the Ark of the Covenant. Nobody knows for sure. But all they know is after in Solomon's temple, the first temple was destroyed, the Ark of the Covenant disappeared. Had, nobody knows where it is. And so then when Herod's temple, the second temple was built, the Holy of Holies was empty except for one large stone. Do you know what this stone is called? The foundation stone. Again, we see a type of shadow, a picture of Jesus. He is our foundation stone. The scripture calls him the chief cornerstone in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Oh, I love it, don't you? Everywhere you look in the Old Testament is a picture of Jesus. Now, the high priest standing in the Holy of Holies, he carefully emptied the incense into his hand, and then he threw it on the coals in the censer, and he waits until the smoke of that incense completely fills the room of the Holy of Holies, and then he carefully retreats backwards. He backs back without once turning his back on the Holy of Holies when he backed outside of the veil. And then he prays a very short prayer as he backs out. And I read that the reason he prays a short prayer is because he's afraid of being struck dead if he stays too long inside the Holy of Holies. And that he was so careful not to violate any of God's rules concerning this day. He had to keep every letter of every commandment. He couldn't make a mistake or he would die. So, needless to say, every eye was strained and everyone was watching and waited. They waited with bated breath until they saw the high priest come out of the Holy of Holies. And when he finally emerged, they could breathe a sigh of relief because they knew that the service of the high priest had been accepted by God. So the high priest, dressed in his white linen garments, he enters into the Holy of Holies a second time during the Day of Atonement to sprinkle the blood of the bullock that he had slain earlier in the day. And after the high priest comes out of the Holy of Holies, he walks to the court of the priest. He then kills the goat with the crimson cord around its neck. This goat, remember, is identified as 4YHWH, the most holy name of God. So the priest now kills this goat, the goat from Yahweh, the goat from God, and he collects the blood of this goat in a golden bowl. And now he goes back into the Holy of Holies for the third time that day, sprinkling the blood in the same manner as he did for the blood of the bullock. And he comes out of the Holy of Holies, he stands before the veil, and then he sprinkles the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat. Had it not been for all of these steps which the high priest performed, it would have been impossible for the priest and for the people to receive atonement or covering for their sins. But their consciousness was not yet free from the sense of personal guilt. That remained to be taken away through the scapegoat. During all this time, during the day, that scapegoat with the scarlet tongue or scarlet red cord, that goat had stood there looking eastward in front of the people, waiting for the terrible load that it was to carry away. The scripture tells us, unto a land not inhabited. Look in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 22. And the goat... Speaking of this scapegoat, and the goat shall bear, carry upon 
on him all their iniquities, all their sin. Where? Unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let go to go in the wilderness. Now, if you're researching the steps that were performed on the Day of Atonement, you'll find that different rabbis over the years list different facts about the sequence of events concerning this day. One of the reasons that there are different views by rabbis over the years is because the Day of Atonement was kept in three different time periods of Israel's history. Number one, in the days of the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness, they were celebrating. Number two, it was celebrated during the time of the, that the first temple, called Solomon's temple, was standing. And number three, it was celebrated during the time of the second temple, Herod's temple, the temple that Jesus entered into and taught. So you've got three different periods of time. So some rabbis may be giving you facts about the events that took place during the time of the first temple. Some research works may be giving you facts that took place during the time that the second temple was standing. So doing research on the Day of Atonement, oh, I spent hours, 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 hours researching this and studying this over the years. So out of all my research, I found two main different views concerning the scapegoat which Jewish rabbis have written about and reported. And I'll share both views with you. The first view of the steps of the sequence of the events on the Day of Atonement. This view is from Alfred Edersheim in his book called The Temple. He was the... He was the, the foremost Bible scholar concerning the temple days when Jesus was here on earth. And if you don't have his books, I highly recommend that you get them before they go out of print. So he writes and records that when the high priest laid his hands on the head of the scapegoat and confessed the sins of the people, their sins were transferred from the people to the scapegoat. Then the priest led the goat out through the eastern gate over an arched bridge to the Mount of Olives, where a specifically appointed priest then led that scapegoat on from this point. And the distance from the eastern gate to the wilderness where this goat was to be taken, the distance was over 10 miles. And there were 10 stations that were set up with a priest there, a man, he would be there waiting on that priest, leading that scapegoat as he approached, just in case he became faint and weary. Remember on the Day of Atonement, you cannot eat one bite of food, you cannot drink one sip of water. And in the desert, if you had to walk 10 miles, wouldn't you get thirsty? You bet. So they would set 10 stations up, one every, um, approximately every mile, just in case this priest would become weary and just couldn't go on. And then finally, after the 10th station, that priest, leading the scapegoat, reached the edge of the wilderness. And the priest then took half of that crimson tongue, it's called, or the crimson rope or cord, we would call it, which was around the scapegoat's horns. He tore it off, and he attached it to a rock on a projecting cliff, a, a rock that was hanging out over this cliff. And then the priest pushed that scapegoat backward until reaching the end of the cliff. And the priest would push that scapegoat backward over the edge of the cliff where it fell to its death. And then when the priest turns around and looks at that crimson tongue, that crimson cord attached to the, to the rock, and if every step had been performed correctly by the priest on the Day of Atonement, if he had made any mistakes and if God accepted the sacrifice of the scapegoat, that crimson cord attached to that rock miraculously turned white 
And my research from the Temple Institute said, this is how the priest knew if an atonement had been made for the children of Israel's sins. And then news of the scapegoat being sent off into the wilderness. It, the news was immediately spent. It was sent back by waving flags of cloth back from one station to another all the way back. They didn't have text messages. They didn't have cell phones out in the wilderness in Bible days. So they would wave cloth flags from one station to another all the way back. And within a matter of minutes, it was made known to the priest back in the temple. And the people, they would whisper it from ear to ear. They didn't even say it out loud. They whispered, the goat had borne upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited. This is an exact picture of Jesus, our scapegoat. Think about it. In Luke chapter 4, verses 28 through 30, jot that scripture down. The religious leaders were so angry at Jesus, they tried to do what? Push him off of a cliff. But he walked right through the midst of them and escaped. Why? Well, it wasn't his time to die yet. Think about it. Everything is a type, a shadow, a picture in the Old Testament of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Now, the second view of the steps concerning the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement is Leviticus chapter 16, verse 21. And Aaron, who was the high priest, shall lay his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities, all the sins of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. Now, some rabbis say that part of that crimson cord or rope was not only tied around the horns of this scapegoat, but part of this crimson cord was also attached to the door of the temple itself. And after the high priest laid his, both of his hands upon the head of this scapegoat while he was praying and confessing the sins of the people, he would once again speak that ineffable name, that unutterable name, the most holy name of God. Why? H-W-H. And all the people would fall down on their faces, worshiping the name of God. And after the sins of the people were transferred to this scapegoat, the goat was led through the eastern gate. Look at it. We read it in Leviticus 16, 21. This goat was led through the eastern gate by a fit man, the King James says. Tradition says that this fit man was a stranger, a non-Israelite. So one view says that it was one of the priests that, that led this scapegoat. And then other rabbis say, no, this fit man was a stranger, someone who was not Jewish. And again, either way, it's a type, a picture of Jesus. He, Jesus was delivered over by the Jews to the Gentiles. The Romans are the ones that nailed him to the cross and, and led him down the Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering, on the way to the cross. Either way, it's a picture, a type shadow, a picture of the Lord Jesus. Isaiah the prophet prophesies of heaven's scapegoat. He prophesies of the coming of the Lord and the Lord dying for our sins. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sins of us all. Jesus, our beloved scapegoat, bore. He took upon himself our sins. He carried them away. John chapter 1 verse 29 says the next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away or beareth away, carries away the sin of the world. Jesus was whipped and beaten, taking upon himself not only our sins, but also our sicknesses. Jesus was 
was taken from Pilate's judgment hall by the Roman soldiers, led down the Via Dolorosa, called the Way of Suffering, to the place outside the city gates called Golgotha, where he was crucified. Jesus died outside the gate, just like this scapegoat died outside the city gates in the wilderness. When that Roman soldier pierced Jesus' side with the sword, blood and then water came out. The color changed from red blood to white or clear, fulfilling the type, the shadow, the picture of that scarlet wool on the horns of the scapegoat and that cord attached to around the, and that rock, a pointing to a picture of Jesus. That red cord turned from red to white. And the second tradition says that when the scapegoat was let go, it wandered in the wilderness until it died. And when it died, it got accepted the substitute of the scapegoat, forgave the sins of the people. The moment that that scapegoat died in the wilderness, a miracle <coughs> occurred. That crimson cord that was attached, nailed to the door of the temple, changed colors. That cord, that rope, changed from crimson red to white. And then when the high priest and the people saw that cord change colors miraculously, they knew that the scapegoat had died, atoning for their sins. And the scripture that the rabbis quote for this is in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall what? Be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Rabbi say that for 40 years before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, that red cord never turned white again. Jesus was crucified 40 years before that temple was destroyed. And after Jesus was crucified, that red cord never turned white again. Why? Because Jesus is the supreme sacrifice for sins. The blood of animals could no longer atone or cover over man's sin. Only the blood of the spotless, sinless Lamb of God could provide forgiveness of sins. Now, on the afternoon of the Day of Atonement, the high priest, while wearing his white linen garments, he descends from where he's standing in the temple, and he goes to the court of the women. The men and the women were kept in separate parts of the temple. Women in Bible days received no recognition. They were not allowed to learn to read. And it's very interesting that the high priest would go not to the court where the Jewish men were, but he went to the court of the women. And he reads aloud from Leviticus chapter 16 and Leviticus chapter 23, verses 27 through 32. He reads the scripture pertaining to this feast, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. And then he quotes from him, reading the passage from Numbers chapter 29, verses 7 through 11, to verify that all of the commandments given in these verses, that he has done every step. And the high priest says a series of prayers there in the women's court. And then he goes out and performs the rest of the sacrifices <laughs> that need to be done on the Day of Atonement. He then enters the Holy of Holies for the fourth and final time and to remove that golden censer and the incense dish that he had left there earlier in the day. And on the day of atonement, the high priest, he entered the Holy of Holies four times. But Jesus, our high priest, only had to enter the heavenly Holy of Holies one time to make an atonement for our sins. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained <laughs> eternal redemption for us. When Jesus, oh, think about it. When did he enter into the holy of holies with his blood? Remember when Mary went to the empty tomb, she saw Jesus and thought he was the gardener. Why would 
would she think he was the gardener? Scholars say in Bible days, gar gardeners wore white linen garments which looked very similar to the white linen garments the high priest wore. Where did Jesus get his clothes that he was wearing when he came out of the tomb? Because when he was crucified, he was stripped naked, scholars tell us that they crucified criminals in Bible days naked just as an added that shame to them. Now remember Mary looked in the tomb and she saw two angels in white seeing the one at the, at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. John chapter 20 verse 12 tells us this again is a picture of the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies which had the two angels on top of it and when Jesus came out of the tomb he left his grave clothes in the tomb so where did he get his clothes that he was wearing when Mary saw him it is believed that angels brought Jesus the white linen high priest garments to put on in order for him to enter the holy of holies in heaven when mary saw jesus she wanted to touch him john chapter 20 verse 17 jesus said unto her touch me not for i am not, not yet ascended to my father but go to my brethren and say to them i ascend i go unto my father and your father unto my god and your god why would jesus not let mary touch him and then later on this same day jesus told the disciples in luke chapter 24 verse 39 behold look at my hands and feet that it is i myself handle me touch me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Why did Jesus say flesh and bones instead of say flesh and blood? You hear preachers misquote this continually. Why did Jesus say flesh and bones and not flesh and blood? Because he had shed every drop of his blood. Why would Jesus not let Mary touch him? And yet later, in the same day, he told his disciples to touch him. He would not allow Mary to touch him because he had to take his blood to heaven, to the heavenly mercy seat in order for you and I to receive forgiveness for our sins. If Mary had touched Jesus before he entered into the Holy of Holies, she would have defiled him. And he would not have been that perfect sacrifice and to provide forgiveness for our sins, just like no one was allowed to touch the high priest before he took the blood of the animals <coughs> into the Holy of Holies or he would have been defiled or become unholy. One last thing I just have to share with you that I learned in research on the Day of Atonement. In his book, The Temple, Alfred Edersheim says that the Mishnah records that at the end of the Day of Atonement, that the maidens, the young virgins of Jerusalem, dressed in white garments, which were specifically loaned to them so that there would be no difference between the rich and the poor. Their garments were exactly alike. These maidens, dressed in white garments, went into the vineyards close to the city, and they danced and they sung. My Gill's Bible commentary also mentions this. And in all my research, I never found it explained adequately, but in almost 40 years of Bible study, I cannot help but wonder, could this be a picture of the wedding day of Jesus, our beloved bridegroom to us, his bride? We will be clothed in white linen, Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. How have we been made ready? By the blood of the Lamb shed for us. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed, clothed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Can you say amen to the word of God? Thank you, Jesus.